Break rate maneuver. has a new look yes amy has a new look hey everyone tonight we're going to be debating whether mormonism is true and to kick us off with our 10 minute opening we have kyle on the side of Mormon. so uh kyle i'm going to kick it over to you for your 10 minute opening and the uh, floor is all yours okay i'll go ahead and share screen then okay hopefully we can see this really happy to be here thank you for having me this is my favorite subject to talk about of all time so uh, Can you just, zoom in a little bit? It's kind of small. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Much here, better. Here, this is just a basic definition of science, and I just wanted to start out by establishing some really basic common ground. So here we have science means just systematized knowledge in general. T jump. Do you agree with that? Um. What was the question? Science means systematized knowledge in general. Do you agree with that definition? Uh, science is a, a method to gain knowledge. I don't think science is knowledge. Okay, so you don't you don't agree with this definition. Science is a way to gain knowledge. It's not a it is not knowledge itself. Okay, so there goes branch of knowledge of study systemat systematic or sorry systemat yeah systematic knowledge any of branches of knowledge systematized knowledge okay so yeah you're just kind of going off of something completely different there. Uh, you're kind, kind of referring, referring to the to scientific, scientific method. So it's a method. Science is a method. Is there isn't, there is no like science right. knowledge. Science is a method. And that method gives us facts, which are then called scientific facts, but science is the method. Okay. So you don't agree with any of these definitions then? No, those are all agreeing with me. Um, systematized knowledge in general is a method. Yes, yeah. systematized a system is a method. System and method are the same thing. Those are synonyms. Okay, <laughs> so it's not just a way; it's organized. The system systematized is different than organized. No, system and method are synonyms. System and method are synonyms. Okay. Yes. Okay. And over here, I've got the definition of evidence. I like something that makes plain or clear an indication or sign. Uh, his fever, or sorry, his flushed look was vis visible evidence of his fever, or I could say, you know, my head felt warm, which was evidence that I might have a fever. So it's not for sure, you know, my hands might just be cold because I'm nervous or something like that, but it's not proof that I have a fever. It's just a sign or indication that this might be so. Do you agree with that definition? Sort of, I would say, I would use the, I would, I would actually use the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy definitions. They're a lot better than the source, the source.com. But the definition of evidence, well, well the, the definition of evidence is anything that can increase the probability of a proposition being true or false. So that's, that is evidence. Anything that can increase the probability of it being true or false. Yeah. Okay. And so someone's head feeling warm, that is. Increases the probability they have a fever. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that'll work. So over here, I'm going to address something that's going to be a little bit out there, but I promise you I'll tie it right back in here. Uh, this is from the Onondagan creation story. It's part of the Iroquois nation's creation story. And uh, it's called the earth on the turtle's back. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. Yes. I have heard of that. Okay. So we've got the earth on the turtle's back, Native American. Uh, they're like, uh, around the Great Lakes area of the United States. And in this story, we have uh, this creation story goes as there's a sky people, a people who live up in the sky. And this woman has a dream. 
And in this dream, she sees a tree and she gets this big prompting that she needs to uproot the tree. And so she goes and tells the sky chief. The sky chief says, yes, we need to pay attention to our dreams. And so they go with the help of the sky chief. She uproots the tree. And all of a sudden, when they uproot the tree, they find this hole in the ground. And that leads down to this other world, basically, that's been beneath their feet this whole time. And as she's looking into the hole, she falls down to this hole. And then the animals come up to rescue her. So all these swans come up to 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 rescue her uh and in protecting her as she's falling and then there's a turtle there and a bunch of animals oh we got to go rescue her and so there's a muskrat that dives way down deep to pick up some earth and he goes and puts the earth on the back of this turtle and so okay that's interesting but there's multiple versions of this story we have this one where uh the woman has this dream that's saying that's what she needs to do but there's another version uh, that comes from a different textbook. In this textbook, the woman was more of a troublemaker, and they kind of villainize her. She's trying to go find some different food to eat. And so it, it wasn't really a, a good, it wasn't really a neutral happening for this fall to happen. But as we look at like the, the main idea here is that there are variations in the same story. There's there's they're both two stories that come from the same the the same tribe, but they're they're slightly different. However, as we really kind of dive into it and take a look at the finer details, we see a lot of similarities between this and just the book of Genesis, chapter one, which is the I'm sure you're familiar with the the Genesis creation story and how things were made. But in there, there's a woman who interacts with, I guess this is Genesis chapter three that I'm kind of diving into now, but there's a woman who interacts with the tree and then there's the fall of mankind. And, uh, but there's a slight variation in here because uh, over here with earth on the turtle's back, there's the animals that are there to kind of protect and watch over the the people but it's reversed in in the book of genesis where man has dominion over all the animals but over here with the onondaga story it's completely reversed it's oh no we the animals are here and they have dominion over over man man wouldn't be here without the animals and it's kind of a really kind of cool influx there i, I think it's the right word just kind of you can see the the mirror image almost but with just some slight variations. And that's kind of how a lot of religions go. They all started off at one basic origin story, and then they kind of split off over time because, and sometimes it's intentional and other times it's not so intentional. Sometimes people just kind of uh, slip of the tongue. Oops, I, my memory isn't perfect kind of a thing. Uh, and then there's other instances, oh, well, I don't really like the idea of, of man having dominion over all the animals. I think animals end up helping. And so uh, they feel more inclined to uh, have more respect for the animals. And so they kind of reverse it in that way. So I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that's really the, um, some strong evidence here that the two stories were from the same origin. And then they just kind of splintered off over time when we kind of see the common features. Now, this next one I'm going to show you. This is from a codex, and this is an Aztec human sacrifice ritual. And I hope you can see that uh, big enough. So here we have the priest, and he's ripping the heart out of his sacrifice. And as you look at that, okay, they've taken the blood of this human sacrifice and they've marked the blood on the lintel piece and on the posts in the background. Blood on the lintel piece and the posts in the background. Just a codex. Yeah, and this is Central America over in the Mexico area. And yeah, that part really stood out to me because that's something we directly see in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. That's what Moses did in, in the, the Passover was he took the blood of the lamb 
and he marked it on the lentil piece. And so it's very, very specific. But this is a human sacrifice instead of a sheep. But when we read the Book of Mormon, there comes a time where they say, where Jesus comes to the Americas and says, I will no longer accept the, the offering of, of blood. I, I, I don't want any more animal sacrifices. That's to be done away. And so uh, in the Book of Mormon, we find that uh, it says right here, and ye shall offer up unto me no more the shedding of blood. Yea, your sacrifices and your burnt offerings shall be done away. For I will accept none of your sacrifices and your burnt offerings. And ye shall offer for me a sacrifice unto me of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And so here today we we understand this to be a very spiritual broken heart being very humble having a lot of humility however right here it's we've got a big sacrifice but they're taking it very literally so it's kind of one of those slight variations and i was like wow so when i look at that i, I see some really strong evidence that there were israelite people in the americas at one time way back in history and so that's right here in the book of mormon uh so there's further evidence when we look at the ancient pyramids. We see a lot of pyramids all throughout the Americas, and uh, we even see mummies. Where did they get this? How, how are they getting all this Egyptian knowledge? Kind of where all of it, these similar similarities, they, we get this preponderance of evidence. And right there in the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, it says, I make a record in the language of my father which consists of the learning of the Jews and the language of the Egyptians. So we've got direct Egyptian influence right there in, in Nephi chapter one. And uh, we also have Hebrew influence right there in the Book of Mormon. So this is kind of furthering that, that pile of evidence. Could I have a time check? Yeah, and uh, we're actually uh, just a little over ten minutes right now. I know oh, we had a I'm little sorry. we had a little open discussion at the beginning, so that's fine. Uh, so if, if we want to do uh, if we want to go uh, stop screen sharing for now, and we're going to go yeah. uh, head over to T Jump there and let him have his uh, ten minutes there of uh, rebuttal. Uh, but just want to let you know, everybody, uh, I am your host tonight. My name's Ryan. Uh, glad you're all here for my debut. This is the first time I'm doing this. I uh, just want to do some housekeeping here. So I want to let you know that Modern Day Debate is a neutral debate pl platform hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you're from. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. We have many more debates coming up. Uh, we do have a Q&A at the end of the show uh, where you can ask questions to uh, our guests here. But uh, just uh, be sure that you're attacking the argument, not the person. Uh, with that, I'm going to kick it over to T-Jump. And uh, yeah, uh, 10 minutes for your opening statement. Uh, the floor is all yours. Sure. So uh, there are a number of contradictions, tons of factual errors, historical errors, uh, mis, uh, literary errors, and lots of errors in, in the Book of Mormon. It's essentially been disproven um, resoundingly in the, like, history so one elephants in ether 9 19 elephants were not did not exist in america at the time of ether it didn't happen um horses didn't exist in that area at the time they were in like canada and some other areas steel there was no steel at that time period steel wasn't invented until later uh silk silk came to pass in the eight later not there wheat and barley um wrong time period um <laughs> sheep didn't exist until about later which in the, when they were brought by the europeans uh goats also introduced by the europeans uh cattle and cow there's no evidence that the old world cattle members of the genus bose inhabited the new world prior to european contact uh swine and also brought by europeans um so there's lots and lots of errors uh, archaeological errors um we can also use native american genetics to show that there's no israeli lineage tied to them we, we we know 
where people are from because we can do DNA tests to show their lineage and there is no Israeli DNA in, in Native American lineage. It would be pretty easy to prove actually. So it's pretty, pretty obviously false. Um, I didn't quite understand uh, Kyle's opening. It seemed like he said they put blood on doors. This is similar to how it was done in the Old Testament. Therefore, there's a religious link. Um, there's lots of similarities between things people do in crazy cultures. This doesn't mean that they originated from Israel. If that was the case, then the blood placed on the doors by the Japanese people would be evidence of Israelis in Japan. Clearly not the case. So um, obviously you can have similarities between different ideologies without them having originated in the same thing as long as they originate in the human mind like there's lots of similarities in religions like they come from a sky daddy of some kind uh, that's not because they all originate in the same religion that's because humans like to make up sky daddies it's something that's very intuitionally convenient for us um, so that's about all i got uh, yeah mormonism is false oh by the way i started a church atheist church the church of the best possible worlds please please check out my go fund me on my twitter go for it well, in there. All right, excellent. Uh, yeah, so uh, we can kick it over to open discussion uh, here, uh, or we can do uh, a rebuttal period. It's up to you. Uh, if you had more uh, screen sharing you wanted to do, Kyle, uh, if you weren't done your presentation, that's fine as well. Um, it's uh, at your discretion if you guys would like to jump into a open discussion, or uh, if you would like to have some more uh, focus time to present your argument there. I uh, I think I'm good. I'll let you know if uh, something pops up that really needs screen. I think I got the the bulk of my points done that needed visuals anyway. All right, <laughs> excellent. Then uh, yeah. So uh, what we could do then is we can kick it into uh, 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 open conversation. Yeah, open conversation. Sorry. Uh, thanks, DJ. All right. So uh, yeah, uh, I'll let you guys have it. Thanks. You said the Japanese put blood on their doors? I've never heard of this before. Um, there's actually dozens of cultures that put blood on their doors. It's actually really common. It's, it's not even, it's not rare. Many cultures that do that. Uh, yes. That to look into it. I've never heard of this Japanese culture. Was it specifically on the doorposts and lintel yes. piece? Okay. Well, well it's, we do it's believe both. that the, the ancient Israelites were scattered and they weren't just here in the Americas. Jesus said, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold them also i must bring and there should be one voice and one shepherd and so we really believe they were scattered throughout the world and that's why we see a lot of the same kind of architecture uh throughout the world and so i don't know if you've ever compared angkor wat out in indonesia and uh compared that with chichen itza and some of the other like mexican pyramids there's humongous similarities between the two and so it really kind of shows to me that the ancients were far more advanced and civilized than a lot of the people in the world today really think they were back then. Well, I agree they were they're pretty advanced for their time period. That's true. But the reason they're similar is because um, they're pyramids. Pyramids are a triangle. It's like three dimensional triangle. Of course, they're any any pyramid made at any time is going to have similarities to other pyramids because it's a pyramid. Um, and so like the materials that they use to make the pyramid are going to be stone because they can't make other things. So in any, any pyramids made of that time period are going to be made of stone and they're heavy. So they're going to have to be transported in a very similar way. So there's going to be lots of similarities. If you build a similar structure with similar materials with the same technology, yeah, there's going to be tons of similarities. It's not because um, they knew each other or had a connection. It's because they were building the same shape with the same tools and the same materials. And so they're pretty, relatively intelligent humans and so they're probably going to use the most efficient way to do that by moving them in a way that they can capably do and not be dumb about it which was the same in both cultures because there's no relic it, the fact that these were built in the same way isn't evidence that they had some kind of connection socially no well it's that's art history for you this kind of recognizing iconography re really strong iconography and kind of watching it one nation influence another nation. And so one thing that we are able to really recognize here in the Americas is we just look at the White House and it's got the big, huge dome on the top. And you can, that was one thing I specifically learned in my art history class is learning about just that iconography and tying it all the way back to the Pantheon in, in Rome and about how 
one started here and then kind of progressed over time. Right, because it's literally based on that. But people built domes in different cultures and they weren't all based on some super dome in the past. They just came up with domes on their own. You're thinking people were building domes before looking at the Pantheon. Yes, uh, people built domes kind of... all over the world. I mean, there, there was the first ones and then other people built them too, not based off of the first one. Um, with other technology domes have been built in multiple ways in multiple cultures they started like underground domes by building the framework and then covering it with mud prior to uh the pantheon the the romans built the first free hanging dome because it was just pretty impressive for the time period but domes have been built way before that igloos have been well built as domes way before that okay okay i can i can take it with igloos but igloos aren't really painted on the underside to look like the heavens. And so there's certain kind of iconography that kind of goes into it. And so it's kind of like having a very specific logo. And then all of a sudden seeing that logo in other parts of the world where it really shouldn't be. And so one of these kind of uh, iconic uh, markings, you can see the triptych doors where you have the larger door in the center, and then you have two smaller doors to the left and right of it. And that's something we specifically see on Angkor Wat. And we also see it, uh, out in the Americas as well. It's because it's it's really convenient to have exits on either side of the entrance. That's that's why those doors are there. That's not this is not some kind of cultural um, zeitgeist that people are like. Hey, we need a big door in the middle and two doors on the side because religion. It's because it's convenient. It's like the same reason that pyramids were built in the shape of a pyramid is because it works. It's convenient, and so. The reason you have two exit doors on either side and one big entrance door in the middle is because it's more efficient to get people out that way. Movie theaters do this, this also. Does that mean that movie theaters are influenced by religion? No, it's just it works well. Okay, so I'm just <laughs> thinking about like Roman columns and they've got the different kinds of Roman columns. And all of a sudden, you if you see those certain same columns in other places in the world, you're going to say, oh, that was just a coincidence that it has... Wait. Like, like the, the exact same columns? No, that would be very, very interesting, but they don't have the exact same columns anywhere else in the world. I, I'm using a, an example. I'm using an example to say, hey, if you saw this Roman column with the kind of the scrolls on the top and the bottom, uh, that's a pretty iconic image. Would you agree? And so if all of a sudden you were seeing those in Japan from like ancient times, you're like, Romans, Japan, what? And so you're, it's going to raise some questions and kind of show some evidence of, one culture influencing another culture. I'm not saying this actually happened with the Roman columns, but I, that does happen with other things, such as the triptych doors, and also with the the steepled uh, arches. They've got certain arches in Egypt that uh, have like stairway arches. That's the best way I could describe it. Kind of sawtooth, kind of stairway arches. There's a whole bunch of them. And so uh, this is kind of one example, but I think we're kind of diverting away from the point of the the main thing, which is specifically marking the doors with blood. And I, you haven't really shown me all this other evidence of uh, the Japanese and if they did it in the same manner or anything like that. Not that it would really knock anything because yeah, it's a, one icon that's being shared among other places. And there can be variations to that. Um, okay, so there are lots of myths people do, specifically with blood. And there's no reason to think that these are connected to culture. That's There's no connection there. You've made no argument for that. Whatever you just said, oh, look, these people put blood on the door. Oh, and these people also put blood on the door. You have made no argument that that indicates that they're the same culture. You just said, oh, look, two similarities. They also That's have eyes. That's what that's what we do. Yeah, we no, look at, that's we not, look for not what historians do. That's not not what historians historians have a very rigorous method for establishing if one culture was affected by another. Just seeing that they do things similar is not that method. That is not what we do. That's like if I said, "Oh, look, you have a beard and I have a beard, therefore we're brothers." Like, no, no, that's not not the correct method. See, well, okay, I'm I'm con considering taxonomy, and the way taxonomy is done is by looking for similarities in animals. And so it, here is a very similar concept. Uh, it's like taxonomy, but with culture. No, 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 no. So, so 
similarities between animals are extremely specific. Like you can find exactly the particular bone and where it splits off from a double hinged jaw joint to know exactly where the evolutionary tree branches off. And so it's not just saying, oh, look, that has toes. That also has toes. They're the same. That's what you're doing or the equivalent to what you're doing. No, the no, fact no, that no, people I, put blood on ancestor. doors. An common ancestor. And so we can say, we, we do that with birds all the time is count the number of toes on the bird and say, okay, yeah, this one's got like the, the cross bird, like the woodpecker, they've got the, the cross, uh, like four toes. Yes. Yes. Exact, precise numbers, exact, precise shape. Those, those are good analogies saying they put blood on doors is not analogous to that. That's like saying, oh, it has feet and elephants have feet. They must be cousins. Sorry to interrupt you guys here. Uh -huh. uh, it, it does look like we moved a little bit away from the topic of uh, is Mormonism true? Uh, I, 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 so uh, if we could move back into the uh, the debate topic there a little bit more uh, succinctly there. Uh, I do also have another announcement here uh, or some more housekeeping, I should say. Uh, if you didn't know, all the debates on Modern Day Deba Debate YouTube channel are uploaded to the podcast within 24 hours of them being live. So modern day, you can find Modern Day Debate on your favorite podcast right now. And you can hear all of these debates ad free. Uh, so yeah, we can push, push the topic a little bit back into uh, the topic of Mormonism. And uh, uh, it seems like that's what the live chat's kind of pushing here. Uh, okay. So, so, so the argument is, is that simply saying that there is a similarity is not evidence that they are intrinsically linked. In order to show they're intrinsically linked, you would need something concrete like DNA. We know for a fact there is no common DNA uh, between American Indians and Israelites. The genetic markers between those two groups are entirely separate. They have a common ancestor m hundreds of thousands of years prior to that. Um, there is no mingling between once you get Israeli ERVs to Native American ERVs. It doesn't happen. There's no such thing. So we, we can okay. tell they are not the same. Okay. So you seem to have this major impression in your mind that if the Book of Mormon were true, it would have to be perfect. No, at least that's kind of the impression that you gave me. You're saying, oh, well, there's all these inaccuracies in the Book of Mormon. And so sure. because there's inaccuracies, it can't be true. Is that that seemed to be your argument before? No, like um, your claim specifically about Israelis being in South America, that to be true would have to show DNA proof, which it doesn't. So that that part we know is false for that reason. Um, the, the claims about Mormonism being like the word of God or whatever, if it is the word of God, you would expect it to be true mostly and not have blatant falsehoods. And it has blatant falsehoods, which would give us reason to believe it's human. It's, it's evidence that it's man-made and not God-made. Right. The very, like in the introduction of the Book of Mormon, and at least in two other places in the Book of Mormon, it says that, uh, this, it has potential errors in it. It openly acknowledges sure. that. It's saying, don't treat me like I'm perfect. Okay. It's got potential er errors in it. It's written by man. It's translated by man. So, yeah, we should expect that. We should expect there to be some kind of errors in it along the way. It, it makes room for that. That doesn't, that doesn't lend evidence that it's the book of God. So, like, I could say, I have a book written by the all-powerful, all-knowing being of the universe. Oh, but it has some errors in it. That isn't evidence that it's actually the case that it's written by God. That's that's called a right. hedge. You're hedge no your hedge your bets. Claims, no one claims it was written by God. If it's like inspired by God or whatever, true facts. Inspired by God, but written by man. Right. It's, Which, yeah. What's the difference Mormon between... Was, what's Mormon the difference was not between, God. What's the difference between a book that inspired by God, written by man with tons of mistakes, and a book made up by man with equally as many mistakes? What's the difference? How do you tell the difference? Um, you said that really fast. I'm sorry. How do you tell the difference between a book that was completely made up by a guy who claimed it was inspired by God and just has a whole bunch of mistakes because he didn't know anything, so he got a bunch of errors, and a book that was actually inspired by God but written down by a guy who didn't know anything and got made a bunch of errors? All right. A bad guy wouldn't write something like this, and a good guy who is just making it up a good guy wouldn't write something like this uh, if, he, if he's just totally ad-libbing and just making things up. If he's just writing a novel, a, a good guy wouldn't do that. Okay, and I'm the not bad following. guy isn't going to write something that's that great. 
I'm not following this good guy, bad guy dichotomy. There's no evidence that good people and bad people have a proclivity to write certain words as opposed to others. There's no no scientific evidence of that. People make stuff up all the time. Good people write bad stories. Bad people write good stories. There's no good, bad people will do this argument. That doesn't make any sense. Um, yes, people can make stuff up. I mean, Jonathan Smith was a terrible person. He was a liar, a fraud, convicted many times over. So he was Jonathan a bad person. Smith? I don't know who Jonathan Smith is. The guy who wrote the Book of Mormon. Whatever his name no, is. no. There's Joseph Smith, and that's, yeah, that's him. Okay, that's him. so yeah. he, he convicted fraud. Convicted fraud. We know he's a bad person, but it, I I wouldn't bring in his character. I don't care about his character. His character doesn't matter. You're trying to make some kind of argument that his character would make it impossible for him to write this book. Like no. In fact, most people who make religious books are bad people. So it would actually make more sense that that bad people would exactly write this. Okay. Well, I'm yeah. So the, the whole thing here is it's not like a, it's not written as a perfect book. And so you're, you're talking before what's the difference between someone just making it up, not being inspired by God and someone who is writing it, being inspired by God. That was your question, right? How do you tell the difference? Like what, what is the evidential the difference? difference between the two? Well, there's the Book of Mormon promise, which is what really makes it stand out. And that is God testifies of his of on on his own behalf. He's able to speak for himself. We believe in a living God, not just a, a dead God. We believe God still speaks today. And so when I have an experience with God and I write that down in my own imperfect language, that's just as valid as the Book of Mormon is for me anyway. Okay, but the question is, is how do you tell the difference between it being made up and it being true? So so people can have delusions and they write down those delusions, which are not true. And then people supposedly have a vision of God and write down those delusions. And those are supposedly true. How do you tell the difference between the true visions and the delusions? Well, we study it out for ourselves. It's kind of a huge part of it. And so Alma talks about treating the word like a seed that we plant in the ground and grow. And so this kind of gets into this analogy of where it takes some study. It takes some thought. It takes some investigation. Well, and I'm asking specifically for your methodology. So I understand that you want, you presumably have some methodology. So I'm asking you, how do you differentiate testimony in of God versus testimony of delusions? That's sort of a specific question about methodology. How do you do it? All right. So the very first start is just through prayer. You can ask God if he's there and God answers his prayers. He's willing to testify and do okay. miracles in people's lives. And so God, that's kind of are you there? Can I get a gold brick, please? Okay. So there's more to it than just that because, and you have to understand kind of the expectations that go into it. And so, uh, okay. God tell me, tell me what magical word prayer I have to say to get my answer. Well, there has to be a, a that contrite heart. Okay, you have to have that contrite heart, being willing to change. Because I'm, moment... I'm totally open to change. I I follow the evidence wherever it leads. Tell me what magical words I need to say for God to answer. Because I've been trying for years now, or for many years, never got anything. So so what what is the magical word combination I need here? Okay, He's the one who judges your heart, not me. And what I do is I help people build that relationship. And so one of those ways that you can really show. <laughs> that you are sincere and are willing to change can be through fasting. That's one great way to, to show hey, I'm, I'm sincere about this going to church. There's certain okay. commitments that you have to show him. Say, I'm, I'm see, I'm look at me. I'm, I'm being committed. And so it's kind of, I'm going back to the seed here. You don't just plant it in the ground. Okay. I'm expecting fruit. Now it, it takes time for that tree to grow and develop and produce fruit. And when you get, once you have that fruit, wow, there it is. And that's yes. how you know. So, so, so how do we verify the fruit is there and not a figment of your imagination? That's the question. Well, like I said, it's like planting a seed. And so we, what is watch... the, what is the success rate? So like, let's say we take a group of a thousand people, we all pray, we all fast. How many of them are going to get the word from God? I don't know the answer to that because different people, is it, have is different it, circumstances, is it more or less than the amount of random chance? That's, that's what I'm interested in. Uh, I think that's kind of uh, amount of random chance. Yeah. So, so just like 
placebo, you know, placebo, double blind trials yeah. where we give half people a placebo, it does nothing and half the people a drug. If the drug has the exact same positive effect as the placebo, the drug does nothing. So you have a control group, which is random chance. How many will see visions of God via random chance? And then you have some methodology and that methodology has to increase the number of people who hear from God. Otherwise, it's no different from random chance, in which case it does nothing. Uh, so you're talking about like a specific like study, uh, get a whole well, bunch of any, people any in method, the room. Any method. So any methodology that you propose that can get us in communion with God, if it works at the exact same rate as random chance, that means it doesn't work. It does nothing. So you need to give me a method that I can do that will have a higher rate than random chance to get into communion with God. And we got plenty of atheists here willing to try it. Willing to get in there and, and do that. So like I said, there's kind of that level of commitment and you could do that. I don't know any kind of statistics for you on the matter. I can just kind of point to my ancestors and the miracles that they've seen in their lives. And I can read from you from their, their journals if you want me to. And uh, yeah, they've seen some really amazing things that happen. Well, well, again, the question is is addressing all of those. It's how do you tell the difference between that really happening and being a delusion? That's the method I'm need, I need before we can go through, is this testimony reliable? We need to know, how do you tell the difference between imagination and reality? My method is novel testable predictions. Works extremely well. It's what science uses. It's the only reliable way that we have that can differentiate imagination from reality. If you can make a prediction about the future that we don't know anything about yet and get it right consistently. That is phenomenal evidence. Simply saying you have personal testimony does not do that because everyone does. Everyone claims to have personal testimony. Every religion, every delusion, every ghost story claims to have personal experience. That is a terrible source of evidence. This is why we don't use it in the court of law. We don't use it in history. We don't use it in science. Okay. And so this is kind of going down to your whole definition of proof, which you don't really believe in because we could be a brain in a vat. And if we are all brains in a vat, then everything I, I we see is a just delusion. To clarify, I didn't say anything about proof. I said evidence, evidence, anything that increases the probability of a proposition being true. So I don't need proof. I need evidence. Okay. Well, Novel you want something that is, you want to know for certain that it's not a delusion. No, 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 right? no, I want evidence. I don't need certainty. I need evidence. So evidence that something is not a delusion is novel testable predictions. It's not proof, but it is evidence. Okay, so novel testable predictions. And so how yes. would you go about in doing that in taxonomy when it comes to classifying animals? Uh, can well, you evolution really... does it all the time. Like evolution has no problem doing this. They say we predict that we're going to find, if evolution is true, we predict we'll find a fossil that is a halfway between a lizard and a fish, and we'll find it exactly this geological time scale, no nowhere before it, nowhere after it, and we'll be able to. And then they say, okay, we've never seen this before. Now we predict it's going to be here. Then we go look, we go dig, and we think, hey, we found it. So that's a novel, testable prediction, which was confirmed for Tiktaalik one of hundreds of thousands that have been done in taxonomy related to evolution. Others would be ERVs. Um, if you predict that two species like elephants and hippos are related, you would expect to see ERV markers that are similar in such a case that they branched off at certain points in the DNA at similar timescales. So, and we test the DNA, we find, oh, look, they do. That's confirmation, novel testable prediction that the two are related. Okay, so I've kind of, talked about the evolution of religions over time. And that's why I shared with Earth on the Turtle's Back and the Aztec pyramids and saying these two things evolved from one common ancestor with the with the ancient Hebrew religion. And that was my whole statement. And so you're and so I've got the Book of Mormon and I've got the Bible and I've got these two these other things which are kind of showing that there's some similarities, such as kind of pointing out number of toes on a bird. And so we're kind of looking here for further ancient things that would kind of connect it as you're talking about kind of those predictions. And so Joseph Smith, to my knowledge, had no idea about these uh, Aztec codexes. No idea. Okay. That was something that was out of his mind. So all of a sudden these codexes pop up and, oh, wow, look at that. I'm going to say that's evidence it's improving the possibility that Joseph Smith was right. Wait, what, what did he so predict? The, what was the novel prediction that he made? The novel prediction he made was that there was 
Hebrew influence here in the Americas. That was his whole thing. He did like 14 year old boy doesn't just, oh yeah, that's, that's totally the thing. So if I predict there's Hebrew influence in Japan and I see a similarity between the Japanese and the Hebrews, does that mean I'm right? If that you there's... find similarities, then that is, that's going to increase the possibility that you are being right. That's true. That, I agree. No. So in order for it to be evidence it has to be specific. You can't just be vague and ambiguous. It's called an ambiguity fallacy. In science, you're not allowed to say there will be some similarities between this culture and this culture. That is not evidence of anything. If you want evidence, what you need is something specific, which is why I said you will find a transitional fossil between a lizard and a fish at exactly this geological scale and never above, never below. It's extremely precise. Saying culture A will impact culture B in some unknown way. And then you look at all of the tens of thousands of things relevant to culture A and try to find one or two similarities between culture B, that is called an ambiguity fallacy. Um, any of the tens of thousands of factors relevant to culture A may or may not be similar with every culture in the world. You can pick a random culture, Eskimos, and find similarities between their culture and Israel culture. Does that mean they originated the same no, it means that people adopted random cultural things, and some of them are going to be the same across cultures. There are lots of flood stories. Does that mean they all came from one flood? No, because floods happen all over the world. And so because floods happen all over the world and impact people in a very profound way, they will all come up with stories related to floods. It does not mean because that they are similar that they must have originated in the same story, one flood. Like, no, it's not how it works. because people have brains and people work in similar ways, their cultures are going to have similarities due to random chance. So again, in order to have evidence of your claim, you need something that works at a higher rate than random chance. And simply saying that culture A will have some impact on culture B will not be higher than random chance because you can find any, any culture, some similarity to any other culture. Okay, so before before you ever made the claim that there's going to be some Hebrew evidences in Japan, you were not aware of any of these kind of things. You weren't aware right. of any kind of similar iconography. And so I think one of those really unique uh, icons in, uh, I guess I'm thinking of China here. China's got the big lion heads. I guess Japan has some of those too, but the, the dragon lion, like, guard yeah. dogs that they put on yes. their temples I'm, yes. I'm just pointing out like a uh, a major icon yes. and so uh yeah if you were to see some of those suddenly pop up in israel that's going to show are, you a there connection. are tons of those uh, all over the world tons of these kind of lion dog, with dog lion statues are very common very common and you're yep. you're thinking those just happen by chance yes because dogs and cats are very common and so people make statues of dogs and cats it's not because they're some of some common culture it's because hey oh look a dog those are pretty cool i'm gonna make a statue of it egyptians had tons of statues of dogs and cats not because they were influenced by japan and japan wasn't influenced in their dogs and dragons by egypt it's because there are dogs and cats at each of those locations and so they made statues independently of dogs in those locations. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of thinking of a coloring contest right now where you walk into a coloring contest and you see a ton of different pictures that are all just colored different ways. They're, it's all the same underdrawing, the, the same black and white drawing that they were going from, but they're just colored different ways. And so I'm going to say, oh, wow, they're all kind of based on the, the common underdrawing. Uh, but you're just saying, oh yeah, they're all just kind of drawing that underdrawing on their own and they just happen to look the same. And they, it can be very, very specific in times. Well, no, no, that's the part you're missing. None of what you said is specific. Blood on doors is not specific. Blood on doors is like sculpture of a dog. Um, they, they don't have the same architecture. They don't have the same historical connotations. It's not like the Japanese dogs have a very specific history to them, which are completely different from the dogs in... Egypt. They both have statues of dogs because dogs are really common, um, but they aren't the exact same statue, which is how historians can tell that they are not in any way related to one another. 
people just happen to see a dog and be like, hey, that would make a cool statue. Uh, and so when you're trying to make a connection between cultures, you can't use something extremely vague like, oh, there's blood on the door or, oh, look, a statue of a dog. Uh, I think you need to predict bias. specifically. No, it's a science. The science has a method specifically to be able no, to you're, determine. You're just saying that it's not specific. And I think it's super specific, especially with the whole heart thing and being a sacrifice. Yeah, human sacrifice was common, just like dogs are common. It's very specific, uh, a sacrifice of the heart, just like the Book of Mormon describes. Sacrificing the heart was extremely common all over the world. All over the world. I'm, yes. Yeah, I'm not familiar with, just saying all over the world doesn't quite substantiate what? your claim. Google heart sacrifices. That they H human mark sacrifice. the blood on doors. Yes, Google blood on doors. Like this is cultural things humans do all the time. Like I don't I don't understand the problem here. Yes, people will kill people and then they'll put their blood on doors or pillars to scare away other people and to be intimidating. It was very common. Romans did blood it. Blood on Greeks doors, did it. Spartans all I get is all I get is uh Egypt and Passover. I don't know, maybe you're going off of a different Google than I am, but uh, yeah, that's that's my thing. It's probably because your, your, your search engine may be a little biased. Okay, so your claim is... Well, I'm claiming that you probably search things mostly related to Christianity, and so it's probably... Okay, so your, your claim is unsubstantiated then. You just said, Google it, and I Googled it, and that's all I got was Hebrew. So, I mean, I, I don't need to substantiate this at all. It's super common knowledge. You can call that's a historian the and ask them. proof. I no, it's it's just like saying the sky is blue. If you don't trust me that the sky is blue, you can go talk to an expert on that one. This is very common in human culture. Go bother a historian on that one. Okay, so, uh, okay, you're just saying it's specific. I called you out on it being it's very specific. specific. It's not specific. Blood on doors is very specific. No, it's not like on the door itself. It like the wood in between. It's on. The door post That's not specific. And the if if you think it is, you don't know what specificity is. You don't know history, but you can take that up with historians. Like if well, you think you that's can... great evidence, then you're done. Like I don't really care. Like it's not. I've proven it's not. You can take it up with historians if you want. Lots of examples. There's plenty of them. Okay, and yeah, I, it's just coming down to like that. There's right Vikings now. that did it. Eskimos. Vikings did it. have done that. I've never yeah. heard of Eskimos doing that or Vikings doing that. I think you're just okay. Do stuff more up research. Again. You can do yeah. more research. Like it's, it's common it's knowledge. It's on you. It's your claim. Nope, you're done. The burden you're of done. proof you is on you. You don't need to give common knowledge things that happen all over the world and be like, ah, it's the same. Like your argument is is just dumb. Saying that, oh look, there's blood on doors in this culture, and there's blood on doors in this culture, does not mean they're the same. Have you never heard of correlation? Does not imply causation. This is very I've, basic. I've definitely fallacy. heard of that. I've definitely heard of that. Your argument is a fallacy of correlation. There, you've made no evidential argument to support that the fact that a culture has one similarity implies that they originate with the same thing. I debunked this argument in its entirety when I told you that every culture throughout humanity is going to have some arbitrary similarities to other cultures. You would need to show that the number of similarities between whatever, the Aztecs and the Israels, was higher than the rate of chance. Until you can demonstrate that, pointing out, cherry picking a few particular things which might be similar is not evidence they are the same. Furthermore, I proved they are not influenced because genetically we can show they have the different ERVs. We know for a fact there was no influence between these two things. So I, I gave three points. That I, I didn't make any points. argument about genetics here. I did oh, I not did. make any argument. I know you did. And so that doesn't have anything to do with my argument. I just said that. Uh, they were taught by the same people. Which means the people had to be there, right? At one time, but they could have left afterwards. And so okay. I can go and teach someone down the street and they can remember the things that I taught them and then I can leave and I don't have to be there anymore. Okay, and that didn't happen. You know, historically that didn't happen. It's been proven that didn't happen. There's evidence. And so we we see the signature. And so it's like, no. I can... Again, again, that's not evidence because you're cherry picking a few things which are the same between several cultures which you can cherry pick from any culture in the world, which means what you really need to do is show that there are more similarities than random chance. So for your argument to actually be a good argument, what you'd have to do is go between all the different cultures 
and see if you can find similarities between those cultures and Israel and see if there's uh, more similarities between the Aztec people and Israel. And again, they also have to use the historical method that they used to already disprove this to, to change their position. If you can change the historical position and show that the historians are all wrong, that would be phenomenal evidence. You're not going to be able to do that, but that would be the first step in trying to make your argument make sense. The first step is by pointing out what random looks like. And so I just take every culture in the world and send it through a blender and say, that's random. And because this does not look like that, therefore it's right. No, you would say if your argument is correct, then there would be more similarities between the Aztecs and the Israel than there are between the Israelis and the Eskimos or the Israelis and the Japanese or the Israelis and the Australians. If the number of similarities is approximately the same, then there's no evidence that the Israelis had any impact on the Aztecs whatsoever. It just happens to be that randomly some aspects of their culture happen to be the same as some aspects of a different culture. So your claim, in order to be verified, you can't cherry pick a few similarities because I can cherry pick similarities of a different culture. You need to show that the number of similarities is greater than that of random chance or what happens by random chance between cultures that are not related. Does that make sense? Well, you're just going to say cherry picking no matter how many things I pull out, I'm pretty sure. No, you'd have to show like what is the number of similarities between all the cultures on average. You would have to do the work to actually show what that is. I don't know what that is. Have you ever done that with anyone? Like if you were to just look at... Okay, if we were to just look at... I do this with science all the time. Like, this is the scientific method. If you make a claim, you happen to have a null set, the, the, I forget what it's called now, p-values, and of the p-values, you have a base, the the placebo, and then you compare that to your expected result to see if it's more or less than the p-values. And so you claim is that Israelis influenced the Aztecs. So for a p-value, what you would need, a neutral value that would falsify your claim is if the number of similarities between Israel and the Aztecs was exactly or approximately the same as the number of similarities between Israelis and the culture they didn't influence. And then if it had more, a lot more, that would be good evidence that it is not just a coincidence. So you, to make this argument not be fallacious, would need to come up with a value of the approximate random similarities between cultures that happen without any association and then show that the similarities between the Aztecs and the Israels is more than that. that simply okay. saying, simply picking a few similarities doesn't give us anything. It's the signature on a drawing, basically. I, I, no. I look at the drawings. I can look at a series of drawings and see very different drawings. But when I look and find that signature to see who drew it, that tells me who drew the picture. That's the basics. With no, no, because there are different signatures. Many paintings have different signatures. So the fact that they have a signature doesn't mean they came from the same individual. So what you would yeah. again need to do to show that it is the same signature, you need a baseline, a baseline number. What is the amount of similarities that happen by random chance between societies that have no influence? You need to get that number first. Okay, and you're, then, you're setting an impossible standard here. That's I don't not think an impossible standard. Ever, no one has ever, ever, ever gone and list and numbered every attribute of an entire society before. Have, you don't need to list that every States? attribute. That's again, that's, that's not that's what you're talking about. I, I'm literally, I'm literally things. telling you basic historical method of how to associate different cultures. This is By literally numbering... what historians do. You're, you're, yes, you're, they take you're the aspects of equation. the culture. They take the aspects of the culture and compare it to a different culture and see if it's just happens to be the same that's randomly happens between societies or if there is an overrepresented proclivity of similarities between the culture and you can tell which cultures influence other cultures. I'm literally just telling you the basic science of how history works here. You take a baseline. A baseline is what you would expect if there was no correlation. You need that number. This is a p-value. It's basic p-value science. Uh -huh. And once you get that number, you compare it to how many similarities are in your two hypothesis cultures to see if it's more or the same to that number. This is not hard. This is I'm not making any unreasonable requests here. It's basic you're, science. You're trying to create this number that no one has ever numbered before. No, nope. kind of, I literally oh. just told you. Yes, they have. This is how historians do it. This is how they know all if the one culture attributes. affects another I can, culture. I can list a lot of other attributes too. This is just the beginning. I don't care. I don't. I need to first. I need to know the number of what is the number of similarities between cultures at random, 
I need to know that number first. It doesn't matter how many ever done that ever. I literally already answered that. Listen next time. So what you need is a baseline value. You listing similarities is irrelevant. I can list tens of thousands of similarities between me and apes. That doesn't mean that my mother was an ape or a monkey. The fact that you can list a bunch of similarities tells us nothing unless we can contrast it to the number you would expect to happen by random chance. Until okay. you can say that, you have nothing. You have zero. All right. You're the one who believes in the whole evolution thing and common commonalities indicate a common ancestor. That's your whole thing. I was, so no, you're, I, was, you're, I was literally saying I have 98% of my DNA and chimps are the same, so I can list literally hundreds of thousands of genetic similarities between me and an ape. Does that mean that my ape was literally, or my mom was literally a chimpanzee? No. You don't claim that. That's you're kind of strawmanning yourself there. Oh my god! So, so the argument here is that the number of things you can list does that tell me whether one was influenced by the other? So I can list tens of thousands of similarities between me and a chimpanzee. Does that prove my mom was a chimpanzee? You're strawmanning no. yourself. No, 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 no! I, oh my god! I don't even know how to. So what you need in order to prove a claim is to say, what is the amount we would expect by random chance? What is the amount of similarities we would expect by random chance between me and an ape? Well, because we come from a common ancestor, it's going to be about 98% of the genome that's going to be the same. So that doesn't actually tell me whether or not an ape was, or a chimpanzee was my mom. Because it's what we expect. If it's not my mom, it's what we expect. So in order to know if a chimpanzee was my mom, you would expect it to be higher than that number. You expect it to be like 99.9999999% of DNA would be the same. Then you could include, yes, my mother was a chimpanzee. But so, so the point here is I can list 98% of similarities, but that does not show a chimpanzee is my mother because it is the equivalent of what we'd expect if it was not my mother. So the point is that you need a baseline number first and then show your similarities, go above that baseline, not just list a bunch of similarities. That's irrelevant. It's gibberish, not science, not evidence. Okay. Well, I've never seen anyone do science the way you're describing by... Then you've never seen anyone do science. I've never seen anyone do science. Literally the way you're every scientific paper, get a p-value. Every one of them. Every single paper. Right, you're you're just making stuff up now. No. Okay, substantiate oh you're your done. claims. You're done. Substantiate your claims, Google dude. p-values. Like you need a baseline. I literally do. You, have you never heard of a placebo? I've heard Pull of placebos. Yes. Out of your, hey, not all science is the same. Why do they use not placebos? All science is Every the same. scientist who does any trials uses placebos. Why do they do this? Why are placebos required in every single medical test? No exceptions. Why are they required? Not every thing every is medical single test. medical test requires, by definition, placebos. By the FDA, that's great it's for required. medicine. Okay, it's a Why little different in art are history. They required? You don't use placebos in art you history. Use the exact same thing in history. You use a baseline p value. Up. Contrast that to the data every time. Your your ignorance of basic science, and right, then saying insulting that, me. That, yes, because you're dumb. And that's I'm an giving insult. you the basic science yeah. to tell you how to provide evidence. You can't do it. You're giving a right. bunch of random things which you think are evidence, given no way to show that it's not just a, an effect of random chance. Yours isn't evidence. I've explained okay. this to you. You're done. I can come up with more and you're just dismissing care. it. You're getting mad. You're just getting mad. Because okay? I've crushed you. you. Up, that's on you. Okay. You you're want done. to lose your cool. That's a, you're you done. You want to lose your cool. That's on you. You're done. We can uh, move because into Because you the, don't want to uh, hear anymore. I got it. We can move into the uh, Q&A now, guys, if you'd like. Yep. That sounds good. All right. Excellent. Uh, and just before we go into Q&A, uh, just a reminder that our guests are linked in the description. If you want to hear more, and that includes the podcast or the episode for this debate, we link all our guests in the description and each podcast episode as well. All right, so uh, we'll get into the uh, the super chats that we had here. So uh, our super chat starts out with Big Bad Mama for two dollars. Says Kyle, Book of Abraham hoax question mark. Do you understand what they're trying to imply with that? Or like implying? They're not being that... very specific. Uh, a lot of a lot of people who don't believe. That's all you can say is. Book of Abraham a hoax. You could say the same thing for people who don't believe in the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon hoax. You know that's just what people say. I say NASA is a hoax. So that's yeah, whatever. Okay, I, if we got that right there, Big Bad Mama, uh, you can let us know in the live chat there. Uh, if you want to clarify a little bit, uh, just pop us a message in the live chat. All right. So uh, uh, Coffee Mom four ninety nine. 
Kyle, what is the current apologetic for the Book of Mormon claim that God turned certain people's skin black because they disobeyed him? Basic science says that is a lie. Basic science says that's a lie. Well, people end up changing over time. And does God end up distinguishing people? Why not? So I'm, you can just say basic science says it's a lie, but... <laughs> Yeah. When do you go out there and describe what God does at all? Like, when do you go do that and say, okay, that's, this is a lie. That's not, okay. When you can show some basic science that says what God does and doesn't do, then we can talk. All right. Gotcha. All right. And, uh, moving ahead and, uh, we have Bob for $2.22 asking, what is Reformed Egyptian? Reformed Egyptian is uh, Egyptian that was made so you can write it easier. And so it's not like uh, straight up Egyptian. So uh, in English, we they have uh, shorthand, writing in shorthand versus longhand. I don't know how to write in shorthand. It's something more reporters did back in the day. So it's that's my understanding of it is reformed Egyptian is like a shorthand Egyptian. All right. Excellent. All right. Just bear with me for one moment here. All uh, right. And Sharik has a commentary for 199. Trump's heavenly clam chair makes God blush. Uh, Sharik likes the chair. All right. Um yeah, for 999, two times over, Sean Erickson uh, asked, uh, well, he didn't ask a question. He has more of a commentary here saying, Kyle, I was raised in Mormonism growing up in Utah, and I came out of it a, a long ago. Uh, you know, just as well as I do, it is demonstrably, demonstrably false. I truly hope you find a way out, my friend. Good luck. Uh, any comments? Oh, he seems to be really omniscient there. <laughs> He's like, oh, I, I know what you know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I'm, I think he's, yeah. Irony? By irony alerts? Irony meter. Irony well, I don't meter. claim to be omniscient. I don't claim to know what you know. So that's one of those boundaries I prefer not to cross. <laughs> all right, gotcha. Uh, all right, so we'll keep going here. Uh, another one from Bob here for $2.22. Uh, we have how, according to the witnesses, did Joseph Smith translate the Book of Mormon? How did he translate it? Yeah, so they're asking how, according to the witnesses, how did he translate the book? Through inspiration and the power of God. Okay, got you there. And Mark Reed for $5 asks, Kyle, Romans used to put hyena blood on doors to protect from witchcraft. T-Jump is correct on this point. Thresholds were important, so was blood. All right, you guys. Uh, hyena think... blood. Okay, that's not really straight from the heart or a sacrifice. Uh, any comments there, T-Jump, on that one? That's kind of for directed to the two of you there. It says you're correct, so, I mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's just, there are similarities between cultures and things that people value. Blood is one of them, hearts is another one. And so the fact that people use those in rituals to do magic is extremely common, and I don't, Kyle wanting specific examples of this is just kind of silly. Like, yeah, yeah, there's tons of them. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how it's, is it being put on the, on the mantle, the top, on the bides? It's just being <laughs> tossed on the door. Like, it's really, really not specific at this point. If uh, we could expound on that. And also, Rome was not that far away from Israel. So should there be some kind of a cultural uh, influence? Yeah. Protect absolutely. from witches? To protect what what do you think happened in the in the Passover? You're kind of to protect from witches. Blood on the, we put the blood on the door to protect from uh, the destroying angel. Uh, so <laughs> we take that as an evil spirit or something like that. <laughs> they, they, oh, the Israelites they did this and that protected them, so we're gonna adopt that. And that's kind of the way cultures are influenced by each other. And so we just look at the Greeks and the Romans and about how they have they very similar uh Correlation is not causation. Similarities are common. You gain, you need a base value of how many similarities happen by random chance before you can. You think don't that believe it's... the Romans believed in the same kind of gods as the Greeks. They just changed the names to a lot of them and altered what? a few of the stories. Those are different gods than the Hebrews. Oh yeah, I agree. I agree. But this is kind of about 
the, the, the question is, is can, people, another. can people do things that are similar by random chance? Does that happen? By random chance? Yes. Do people randomly do certain cultural things that happen to be really similar because Putting of random one block chance? on top of another, I could say that it, that people could randomly do that. Okay. Right. So, so, so the question is, is how do you tell the difference between similarities that happen by random chance and those that are more than random chance? The question you need to answer is, is, well, how often do they happen at random chance and how often would be more than random chance, right? So we can look at the Greeks and the Romans, right? You're the one talking about this big P value with the, the Greeks and the Romans. Where do you see that P value anywhere? Or is it just saying, oh, yeah, we see similarities. I'm going to call you out on this one saying that you're just, you know. We know specifically that the Romans, the Roman gods are translated to the Greek gods and, and they have different names for the same thing. We know those are culturally translated from one to another because of the amount of similarities is higher than that of the rate of chance. There are and lots of similarities. Was, okay, so you're, you're, okay, I'm trying to what? hold you to your same standard that you're trying yes. to hold me to. And sure. so you're saying that we've got all these things and we can't just say it all happened by correlation does not equal causa causation. We have to have the p-value. We have to have yep. the, all these numbers in there. Yep. I don't see any numbers. Have you ever they, heard of any numbers? Yes, they every, literally, every literally, literally what they do ever, in history. Yes. I've, in literally every history textbook I've ever read, I've never heard them yeah. list out the numbers when it comes uh, to the similarities. Maybe and you so should if you read want to claim that books. This, if you want to claim that's the case, substantiate your claim. Um, well, again, they all do this. This is literally a thing. All do what this. What is the uh, amount yeah. of similarities that happen by random chance? Is this more or less? That's that's the premise of every paper when they're claiming similarities. All right. Well, let's see this. Doesn't with happen the by and random Romans. chance. Is this more than random chance? That's that's the question. That's how you and know. We, we can look at the the Mayans and the Aztecs, the Greeks and the Romans. We can. There's a lot of different neighboring uh, civilizations that have influenced each other. We could look at Japan yes. and China. And Japan they happen and at a higher rate than civilizations that are unrelated, right? If civilizations are unrelated, they will have some similarities, but that number will be lower than civilizations that influence each other, right? They're going to have more similarities, right? Yeah, yeah. And so oh, that's what I'm talking about, but I've never seen anyone number it. You're saying that it's all about the numbers. And so yes, China and Japan, is. somewhere, somewhere out there would have had to number it but you have yes, they no... do they do they literally do in Let's all of the papers Let's read the papers on history on how they make Let's similarities read papers but i am not going to point you to any specific papers because because they all have it Let's pick one because it's bs okay you're just making stuff up just like last time you were wrong your when claim. i was making stuff up about the blood on the door you're wrong this time as well you're just trying to insulate yourself i, and your I false still beliefs. haven't seen any i still haven't seen anything to substantiate your claim Again, you're just trying to insulate yourself from common knowledge facts of history. Please get educated on basic academia. Just Google now some you're just history papers. Because you're mad. <laughs> no, I've destroyed you. Like, you just don't no, know you history. You're just, you're just completely up destroyed stuff. you. Oh, yeah, let's, uh, you can't let's destroy me without substantiating your claims. Yes, right, p let's... values, common term used in all papers. Oh, but you haven't given a specific paper. It's p all values. Papers, it's all papers, really? Hmm, yes, I've never seen yes. that in. Yeah, I, well, they're pretty the important. Last... You may want to Google basic scientific facts before yeah. you talk about things because yeah, it's pretty important. Talk the last to a historian. scientific paper I read was from Jacqueline McLaughlin or McLaughlin, as some people like to say, and uh, which is saying science never proves anything, but I don't see any kind of p value in that paper. So you're saying it's in all papers, right. so therefore it should be in that paper, but it's not in that paper, so therefore you're wrong. It, it, well, it, she probably doesn't know how to write a paper then, but. This I is agree, Dr. Jacqueline McLaughlin in the college in the in the Journal of College Science Teaching. So she's a teacher of the teachers, and I can pull it no, up for not. you right now, and I can screen share it with you, and totally right. demolish you on that. So, uh, no, but it because does you're have a making this, you're making this all-encompassing claim. It's in all papers. That's your all-encompassing claim, but it's not the case. Okay, but your dumbass paper has nothing to do with reality. It's, it's not a claim about oh, reality. Well, I'm glad you disagree with Jacqueline McLaughlin because no, I no, 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 no. Phil philosophical conclusions have nothing to do with does one culture or one fact in reality relate to another fact in reality. Saying science doesn't prove stuff is not a derivative equation between two facts. What you're saying is just again your ignorance of science to make a re relevant analogy here. If you're trying to compare two species or two cultures and want to know. If they relate in some way, you're going to need a base value of how much they're going to rate by chance and the number of relations to know if it's more than that. 
This is very basic science. The fact that you're so ignorant of basic science is just astounding. I've debunked you're you. Just, you're just on. throwing more insults. I've just debunked you're just you. throwing move more on. insults. Okay, I can be more respectful I've debunked you. Move okay. on. Okay. All right, let's move okay. on to the next question there, the, fellas. The person doing the debunking doesn't get all all insulty. They don't, there's no need for that. If, if you're winning, there's no need That's to a fallacy, insults. fallacy, moron. You can insult someone and win at the same time, as I'm doing now. Moron. All right, let's move on to our next question there, fellas. Super chat from Turing Test 2. Kyle has inoculated himself from against education. Agreed. (laughs) All right, so for 222, Bob has sent in another question here. Uh, The question is, why was Joe Smith in jail before his assassination? I think that's for you there as well, Kyle. Why was he in jail because of his for his assassination well people didn't like him and so he got thrown in jail multiple times throughout his life and so yeah people would accuse him of different things all throughout his life and yeah the question is yeah if he was there like why would they give him a gun that was like a big thing there's a lot of things that kind of went into there he was there peacefully he was there peacefully he was being held there against his will he yeah if he wanted to go out and fight the the jailman, he could have done so, but he didn't. All right, got you there. All right, so uh, Elusive Viper sends in $10 and says, how does Kyle address the idea that social traditions can arise from biological evolutionary means? Blood is objectively important for life. It's not impressive for multiple societies to value it. Um, so just to clarify at the start of that question, uh, how does Kyle address the idea that social traditions can arise from biological evolutionary means? Well, <laughs> social, like language itself, if we get into ed- etymology, a lot of these languages kind of come from very common things. We, they all kind of come from root cultures. I hope we can agree on at least on that part. And so it happens the same way with language language itself kind of shows common ancestors of man and that's basic etymology and so it's goes farther than just language it also comes out in cultures and so a lot of people view blood as life because they come from the same kind of cultural background or originating in the same places their languages came from or they die when they bleed, and so they think blood is important because if they lose it, they die. Um, could you be. also associate blood with death in that in that way. Yes, that's probably why it has been seen as important throughout all cultures, even though they have no relation to one another, because they die if they lose the blood. Or they die if they see the blood. So it, it can equally be put on with death. In fact, with it actually gets seen as death a lot of times because... Uh, a lot of people say, oh, their divinity don't bleed. And so that it actually becomes a mark of mortality. Having blood is make what makes you mortal. All right, gotcha. Um, I got Ozean Talks, $5. I believe God does not exist and that I'm rational for my belief. Not sure about Mormonism with infinite gods and humans with one causing the other. That's the... With- Okay, so can you say that again? Uh, yeah, I'll read it entirely. I believe God does not exist and that I'm rational for my belief. Uh, so the bulk of, I think, the commentary is not sure about Mormonism with infinite gods and humans with one causing the other. With one human causing another human to come to pass. Or I guess there's the a lot of... Because in Mormonism, you can become a god and... No, no, god... no, no, no. It's, it's we are gods. We are children of God. And so that's kind of... Uh, Jesus said, ye are gods. That's written in the book of Psalms. Yeah. And so it's not just having one god, but we are all the children of God. All right, gotcha. So if they want to say they don't believe in a god, they have to define this word god. And so yeah, I just look at the ancient Egyptians and they believed their leaders were gods and that was something like a title that even like the judges and and throughout the uh throughout the old testament they would be referred to as gods uh they'd get that title being god's representative and so if you want to say that judges don't exist that's on you all right excellent so uh we'll continue on here uh matt lay sends in two dollars i hope i said that right uh it says when does the mormonism debate start uh so we can we can move on from that comment there. Uh, for $10, Rihanna Randall says, 
Um, okay, a uh, book of Abraham. Joe translated Egyptian and said it was written by Abraham. Then it was actually translated and turns out to be a basic funerary test. Please explain how this, that's not a con. Please explain how that's not a con. Well, we can look at the book of Abraham and do a deeper study on that if we have time. And so, uh, yeah, that's all I can say on that. Okay. Uh, and how are you fellows doing for time right now? Because we have a couple of questions in the live chat, uh, but we're getting near the end of the super chats uh, here. Uh, so we can keep going with some of the other questions that we had in there. It's uh, up to you fellows entirely. Sure. I, I got one super chat from my end. Uh, Kyle, I see similarities between your hair and Hitler's. How heavily were you influenced by him? See similarities? I yeah. don't know. See, that one's a little bit too on the uh, attacking the person side of things, but I uh, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that T-jump. There we go. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we have another one in here for $5. Uh, Brigham Young taught that both the moon and sun were inhabited by people. Has the Mormon church ever found scientific evidence of that to be true? I haven't seen any scientific evidence of Brigham Young ever saying that. And so uh, he's been attributed with saying a lot of different things. Exactly how many of those things he actually said, I don't know. So I think we'd have to kind of cross that bridge when we can see the evidence for it. Okay. Gotcha. And our last super chat uh, for the super chat question so far, we have that band Dana guy. Uh, it says, Kyle, do you agree that any contradiction proves that it's false? If you say no, then you have a different standard for moon landing versus Mormonism. Any contradiction for, okay. Well, when it comes to the scriptures, I look at like a whole collection of things okay and so i kind of test it out piece by piece and so i can say okay this part's true this part's true this part's true oh but i'm not really sure about this part and so but i'm going to go in and look for other things and so i was talking about this with the bible recently okay the bible talks about a place called jerusalem does jerusalem exist okay jerusalem does exist that part of the bible is true okay well it also talks about a place called egypt does Egypt exist? Okay, yes, Egypt is an actual place that does exist. Okay, that part of the Bible is true. And it also talks about the Red Sea. Is there a Red Sea between Jerusalem and Egypt? Oh, yes, that does exist. Okay, that part of the Bible is true. And so we can break it down into multiple pieces, and then all those pieces together make one big uh, thing, one much larger picture. But if, okay, well, uh, it says something about corn in uh in Jerusalem, they, they planted corn. Did they have corn at the time? I don't know. I don't think so. I, maybe that's an error in translation. And so that part might not be true, but does it disprove the entire book? It, it disproves part of that book, not the entire book. All right. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, well, we wait for uh, more Super Chats. If you guys aren't in a hurry to go anywhere, uh, I get some regular questions I pulled out of the chat that uh, might be of interest conversation here, uh, if you guys want to stick around for those. So uh, I have here uh, from Joe Doman asked earlier on, what supernatural events has Kyle seen, if any? What supernatural events have I seen, if any? Uh, I've seen quite a few uh kind of like yeah i've i talk about some of the dreams i have i've had on my channel i've had different dreams that have been significant and have meant something to me learning things that i'd never known about before like i didn't know what treacle was and now i had a dream uh recently i had this dream where i spoke with john wesley powell and then i was like okay what's your favorite food and he tells me it's like a treacle smoothie and i woke up and i was like it's a really oddly specific dream why would i randomly be dreaming about john wesley powell and uh yeah and, and what's treacle and so i actually went and looked it up and uh john wesley powell's an actual person who was kind of famous explorer in the in the midwest i, I knew about that vaguely but i had no idea what treacle is and so i i, I didn't even know how to spell it so i went and started looking around online to try and uh, figure out what treacle is. And I figured out how to spell it and found out that treacle is a kind of molasses. 
a molasses that was back in John Wesley Powell's day. It's the right time period. And uh, and it was a drink additive. And so I thought that was interesting. So that's kind of one example. I could talk all day about other examples that I've had or my ancestors have had, but I think, yeah, we'll give some time for other people. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I do have one here as well for uh, T Jump. Uh, somebody made a commentary on, uh, they said that you had made, said the phrase, the science of history, and they had a bunch of question marks. Um, I'm not sure if you had said that or if you had commentary on that, but. Uh... Yeah, history is a science. The field of history is one of the fields of science. I'm not sure what he, so there's, it has a methodology. The methodology can be used to verify claims. Um, history is a science. It's one of the soft sciences. I don't, I don't understand the question exactly. I think he's looking for the methodology of history and how you put, use it specifically like the scientific method in history is it's not really something that you do as much testing with maybe. Well, you do actually, there's lots of them, archeological testing. So you make novel predictions about where you'll find, like they did this for the population of uh, the promised land. After the Exodus, they made predictions about how many um, pots and huts and things they would find when they dug up every inch of land from the location and they did this and they found that the population was significantly smaller and never had a massive increase. So they do the same novel test and predictions in history that they do in every science. All right. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So we got another super chat in here, a dollar 99 from Kyle. Uh, as, sorry, not from Kyle. Sorry. From coffee mom says, Kyle, New York exists. Is Spider-Man true? No, no. Okay. But that part of Spider-Man is true. So. Okay. Any comment from you there, T-Jump, or good on that? <laughs> well, it's it's a perfect analogy for his argument. The fact that there is one similarity between two stories doesn't mean that the two stories are uh, inspired by one another. I think that the better way to phrase it would be something like, was Spider-Man influenced by a different story that had... Uh, New York in it because they both have New York. Well, no, they could both just have learned about New York in completely separate ways. It doesn't necessarily entail that one story would have been inspired by another. Um, they can both come to the same New York example of a fact without actually having been inspired by one another. Okay, what about Ninja Turtles and the movie that just Spider Man, Amazing Spider Man number two, and Ninja Turtles, the whole plot line of mutating the world climbing up to this big tower and having this big epic battle on top of the tower. We see commonalities in both movies. Yeah, those it's are kind tropes. Of like the same like there's, plot. Well, there's there's lots and lots of tropes that are very similar between movies that have absolutely no relation to one another. So like towers, fights on big towers is something that's happened in tens of thousands of movies. That does not mean that they are all inspired by one super movie that happened first that had battles on towers. Um, there are common well, it's themes. It's kind of trying to spread mutagen all over the place. And so Spider-Man 2, they're, they're trying to turn everyone oh. to the lizards. And then, yeah. The I Mishander have no idea about and Ninja Turtles teenage... wants to turn. Like, I don't know the specifics movie. of those two stories. So I can't, I don't actually know if they're related to one another or not. But I do know that there are tropes in movies that are, there's lots of tropes in movies. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all inspired by the same thing. Okay. So, but we, we do agree that there are a lot of recycled material that you see all the time in movies where one movie is sure. definitely influenced by another movie sure so all of a sudden if we see another movie come out there that has uh people living in a computer program you're gonna say oh, wow I'm, I'm and you're gonna immediately go start looking for similarities to like the matrix or something like that right yeah but it doesn't mean it's influenced by the matrix because there are movies that exist independently came up with these stories without watching the matrix like the fact that they have the same story doesn't mean that they originated from the same source material okay i think the more recent one is uh i read the book i robot and i see that book influencing tons of other movies uh, out there from uh, similar concepts like mother uh, if you've ever watched that one on netflix that one's very much kind of borrowing from i robot all right, excellent. Um, yeah, we have another one in here from That Bandana Guy. Uh, another one for $10. And he asks, Kyle, then you don't have the same standard in thought when it comes to evidence. 
in the moon debate, you said the moon landing was fake because of contradictions, but yet not in Mormonism, question mark, dishonest. And he's coming at you a little bit there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you'd have to go into more detail than just that. Like he's got to substantiate his claims. All right, excellent. Uh, so yeah, that was the last uh, super chat there. Let me just move over to some of the other questions I had here. Uh, Master Optics asks, what does architecture have to do with Mormonism? What does architecture have to do with uh, the Book of Mormon? And so the Book of Mormon specifically talks about a group of Israelites with that Egyptian, the Hebrew Egyptian culture coming to the Americas. And that's kind of like a, a major theme in the Book of Mormon from uh yeah, a good most of most of the Book of Mormon here uh, talks about that family coming to Americas and then growing from there. And so a lot of that is directly all about that. And so we're talking about Mormonism. I'm talking about the Book of Mormon. And so, yeah, great, great book. It has you know, a lot of different details on that. And so uh, there's a lot of really fine things about it that. I'm just going to say that Joseph Smith, there's no way he could have known that, uh, such as the codex is here. Yeah, so his his, ar his architecture argument made logical sense. If there was lots of architectural similarities between Israel and the Aztecs, that would be good evidence that they influenced one another. So that I, the, I think the question um, didn't understand the logic of his argument, which it was a logical argument. I just don't think it's true. Okay. All right. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So we have another super chat here. Uh, let me just look this, uh, just me a second. So uh, from Montero, uh, $2 says, why did Joe copy Freemason, Freemason rituals into his temple? Why is there Masonic like similarities within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Well, Joseph Smith saw a lot of things, and when he saw certain things, those things inspired him. And so, from like ancient days, and so, uh, yeah, that's kind of what opened his eyes. And so, the way that it was currently being used was wrong. And so, he it's about a, a restoration, taking things that are currently being misused and correcting those things and using them the right way. All right, gotcha. And that, so I also point out that Masons killed Joseph Smith. That was they were the ones who murdered him when he was dying. He was calling out to the Masons he recognized and the group of uh, people. So, all right, awesome. And I'm uh, so sorry there, Kaladas, that I'd missed your super chat there. Uh, uh, had sent in a, a twenty dollars super chat. Asked if uh, Kyle, if significant cultural similarities between Israelites and Aztecs existed then how come we don't see it in significant cultural practices such as warfare? Why were they so different? <laughs> There's a lot of time. And so the, these ancient Israelites came in around like 600 BC. And so there's from 600 BC and then going on, there was a lot of time for them to be influenced by other cultures around them. It never said that they were, they got here to an un, uninhabited place. It actually says they got here and that there were other people here. And so uh, other tribes that they were influenced by. And so there's a lot more mixing going on there than just, okay, it's a direct influence, only one line of influence. All right, excellent. Uh, sorry if I seem like I'm coming at you there, uh, Kyle. I got a lot of You're questions right. here for you uh, from the uh, super chats. Um, just uh, bear with me here while I just scroll up here. Uh, my apologies. I just uh, lost that one there. So uh, yeah, there we go. How many wives uh, from Toy Ranch for $5? How many wives did Joseph Smith have? If your answer is less than 30, look it up. Um, I, I've specifically looked into the number of wives. And so a lot of those things are kind of like hearsay. Uh, there are other ones that are much more specific and people, oh yes, he, I, we were married. And so I'm going to say more than one. I can feel confident in saying that. Uh, I could say as much as 10, but I don't know. Uh, a lot of the details after that gets kind of wishy-washy. And so, yeah. All right. But yeah, 
uh, whether or not Joseph Smith had 10 wives or 100 wives, that doesn't really disprove the Book of Mormon. It just kind of says, okay, that Joseph Smith had a lot of wives. Doesn't prove the Book of Mormon was wrong. All right. Excellent. And that bandana guy has struck again for $5. Says, Kyle, in the Book of Mormon, people getting baptized in Jesus' name before Jesus was born, just to name one of my many contradictions. So I think he's saying, yeah, the people were getting baptized according to the Book of Mormon before Jesus was born. Uh, uh, they seem to think that baptism was a new thing in the New Testament, that uh, that John the Baptist suddenly started baptizing people. I don't think that's the case, and I don't know what's giving him that indication that baptism was a new thing in the New Testament, not an old thing that kind of went before Jesus was born. Well, uh, to our Super Chatters uh, credit here, they said that uh, specifically that they were being baptized in the name of Jesus. I think that's kind of the specific thing that he was honing in on there. Um, in the name of Jesus. And so the Book of Mormon was translated into English. And so I understand that Jesus's name was actually uh, Joshua and, uh, and the Hebrew, kind of Yeshua. Uh, and, but it was kind of the Aramaic was closer to Jesus or something like that. And so we end up kind of going with it that way. So there's different pronunciations, but it was it was translated into a, a language that we can understand and kind of. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, Cal's right. Um, baptism predated Christianity. Uh, it was Thank you. Done in Judaism prior to Christianity. All right. Also, there's several other religious sects that did it outside of Judaism. That's really interesting, kind of looking into that. That's kind of one of those markers for me, kind of one influencing another. If you're finding baptisms in other locations, just randomly, that'd be very peculiar. All right, excellent. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. I got $5 from Heinrich van uh, Nieuwenhausen. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, his question is, Kyle, you are putting too much emphasis on your intuition. Do you do anything to counter your biases? How would someone else independently verify these commonalities without your intuition? Uh, without my intuition. So I'm, when I'm thinking of intuition, I'm just thinking about my brain and my ability to think for myself. And so they're trying to ask me, what's a way I can think about this without thinking about it? The question is, is you think there's a connection between these two things based on your intuition. How do you show there's actually a connection between these two things and it's not random chance? That's the question. So you're trying to just eliminate bias here, not just thinking about taking my brain out of it. Yeah. So it's like he's saying that you have an intuition that is your bias. He's saying, how do you show this is actually a connection and not just a figment of your bias? Well, that, this is kind of where I started out by talking about the word evidence. And so my, my head is warm. Okay. And it feels warm. Is it, that's evidence that I might have a fever. Is it proof that I have a fever? No, because my hand might just be cold. And so that, that's all I did was present this as evidence. If you want proof, it comes down to building that relationship with God for yourself, getting answers to your prayers, witnessing the miracles for yourself. And that's what ultimately puts it down for it in the end for, for proof that you don't believe in. So I understand you don't believe in proof. That's why I didn't address, go straight for the proof. I wanted to kind of build on common ground. Awesome. All right. And uh, we have a good question here, um, <clears throat> making a declaration for five dollars. Uh, they say the Book of Mormon is false because there were no horses in America until the Spaniards. All right. Well, T jump started off by disagreeing that there were different parts of America that had horses and other parts that didn't. So well, I'll take that common ground for what it is. OK. All right. Awesome. Uh, Rihanna Randall, five dollars. Uh, the first edition of the Book of Mormon was written in the Trinitarian view. Only later did Joe split the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Why do you think that is? 
think that there's room for additional revelations that kind of came into play down the road. And so uh, I think he was learning about things as time went on. All right, excellent. And just bear with me here. I got to scroll up because we've got quite a few super chats come in. Just bear with me here. All right. So uh, Dion, $5 says, if the Book of Mormon is true, why do Native Americans fail to turn white when they become Mormons? Uh, because they don't need to. I think that'd be kind of strange, really. It's not like there was a reason for a distinguishing uh, a distinguishing factor and what's the reason at this point all right got you there uh rihanna randall again why so many contradictions between the first versions don't sidestep uh they have come in the side chat so they want a real direct answer for this question here why so many contradictions contradictions between the many first versions the many first versions, uh, they're being very specific about this, about some kind of contradictions, but they're not pointing at any specific contradictions. There are contradictions, but what contradictions? So it's not specific enough for me to answer. All right, gotcha. Uh, Montiero for $2 asks, why does LDS refuse to excavate the Hill Camorra? Why do they refuse to excavate it? Uh, I don't know if they haven't heard of the history with it, but a lot of people have been digging up that whole hill like throughout throughout history. Before it was bought, treasure hunters would go all over that hill trying to find additional gold. And uh, so I don't know why they'd need to find further excavations when a lot of other people then. So I don't know, maybe they're holding it like sacred. They do kind of treat it like a, a sacred ground. And so I don't know. I, that's the best answer I can give you. All right, excellent. Uh, Rihanna Randall again strikes for $10. The church says marriage is between one man and one woman. Not true though, is it? Question mark. The prophet and the oak had two wives and will practice polygamy, correct? The prophet and the oak. I'm not sure what he's referring to there, but I just can point to ancient prophets. It was not like a new thing. Joseph Smith said, hey, we're kind of going for a restoration of all things and the yeah, in the Bible. And, and so that was kind of one of the things that was taught historically in the Bible. We look at Abraham and he had multiple wives. And so yeah, so he ended up having multiple wives as well. All right. Awesome. Uh, that bandana guy, $5 again. Uh, so the last question they'd asked was about the uh, the baptism timeline. So they did message back to clarify. Uh, they say, no, Kyle, I am talking about the timeline. Jesus wasn't born. Therefore, you can't be baptized in the name of Jesus. You can't be baptized in the name of Jesus before Jesus was born. I don't know where they're coming from with that. I, I think yeah. I think their first question was implying that there's a claim maybe in Mormonism that people were being baptized in the name of Jesus before his birth. I'm not sure if that's something you're aware of. Yeah, well of. they that's, yeah, that's taught in the Book of Mormon point. like 600 BC that they knew Jesus was going to come. Like there's a lot of prophecies even in the Old Testament of the coming Messiah. And so they were being baptized in the name of this coming Messiah. And so I don't know, like, there's a lot of prophecies about him coming. And so I don't really see where they're coming from on why. Oh, how did they know? Well, a lot of people knew. We just look at, like, all of the parallels when it comes to Moses and Jesus. And, yeah, there's a lot of parallels between that. I can look at Joseph in Egypt. Uh, Joseph in Egypt, uh, there's a lot of parallels between him and Christ. And, yeah, there's just tons and tons of them. And so, like, all of the scriptures point to Jesus the way, the true, the truth, and the life. We almost done? <laughs> yeah, uh, I was going to say, uh, we've only got a few more Super Chats here uh, to wrap up. Um, from Rihanna Randall, $10, your proof is the promise and the prayer which every other faithful theist has. 
How can you say they're wrong if you came to different conclusions the same way? Is faith a reliable path to truth? I'm not really aware of too many other religions out there that teach we can know through prayer. Like, yeah, I don't see the Buddhist saying, yes, you guys can pray and then Buddha is going to answer your prayers and work all these miracles in your life. I, I've never heard that before. I've, yeah, so exactly where this is coming from, I don't know. So, it's enlightenment, not prayer, but yeah, they do. Okay. Skeptics and scoundrels, I will let you fellas know in the live chat that uh, we're going to wrap it up here in the next few minutes. So, uh, uh, yeah, we'll get these questions done up here as I think T jumps uh, uh, ready, to, uh, ready to call it a debate. Uh, Kyle, you claim similarities between two. Oh, sorry, I, I'll start from the top here. Skeptics and scoundrels, ten dollars says, Kyle, you claim the similarities between two cultures as evidence of a relationship. For just a moment, let's pretend you're wrong. How would you come to realize that? How could you? How would you falsify that idea? So he's he's asking if there's something that could falsify your claim. How could that? be falsified i don't know it's kind of for me the one i've been thinking about a lot lately is uh just like okay how can you prove that the earth is a globe at this point and so that's just kind of the 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 picture that i've got in my mind is okay well at this point you'd have to like crumple it like take a pancake and crumple oh. it into a ball and that's how you prove a pancake is like how, how do you prove that this pancake is flat and not a ball? And so, yeah, it was like, I can't prove that this pancake is is not a ball. It, it's it's a flat pancake. And so it's kind of the same thing with this is I can't falsify it. It's kind of so blatantly obvious. I, I forgot you were a flat earther. Oh. Yes, I'm a flat earther. So. All right. Brian Jenkins, 499. Kyle, why does... Sm why does Smith have extramarital affairs with dozens of women and only received his revelation of plural marriage after Emma became suspicious? Um, again, that's a open claim. There's a lot of people who throw things at him and smear things at him, but yeah, that's got to prove that they actually happen first. All right. Excellent. Uh, well, yeah, we'll whip through these last couple chats here and then we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, they just keep coming in. Uh, Kyle, the issue now, I don't know who to trust. You or the other religion's weak evidence uh, is when the conclusion can equally be substituted for the arguments. Well, uh, I say I don't, I'm not telling you to trust me. I'm not telling you to trust the religion. I'm telling you to trust our Heavenly Father. Let him speak for himself. God speaks, not just spoke. God, yeah, God speaks his his works are without end and his words never cease that's the, that's the phrase i'm going for awesome uh good question five dollars for t-jump t-jump the last american horse died ten thousand years ago during the glacial age and they were three-toed horse like mammals sure that's that's horses in america all righty okay why couldn't Joseph Smith, sorry, Montiero for $2, why couldn't Joseph Smith re-reveal the stolen Book of Mormon pages? Why couldn't Joseph Smith re-reveal the stolen Book of Mormon pages? I, I don't see why he couldn't have. Uh, it just wasn't there for him. It just, that was it. All right. It, it comes from, it's revelation from our Heavenly Father. And unless he gives it to him, it's not going to happen. All right. Excellent. Well, that's the end of our super chat. So I think that will conclude our uh, our discussion here for today. So I'd just like to say thanks to T Jump Kyle for uh, coming out and debating, and uh, everybody in the live chat there giving me an easy time on my debut here uh, <laughs> doing the moderation. So thanks everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Okay. Thank you. All Peace right. out. Thanks, fellas. Okay.